Hey everybody, welcome to episode 42 of the Metal Detecting Show podcast. My name is Kieran, and I have been metal detecting for nearly 30 years and this week we get back on track after the Christmas break with a discussion on hunting for meteorites. We look at how to find meteorites, how to distinguish a meteorite from a normal terrestrial rock and the new craze, micrometeorites. So let's get on with the show. Hey everybody, before we start, I want to thank you for listening to the podcast and I hope you enjoyed the show this week. But before we begin, I want to give you the following information. If you want to give me feedback or interact with the show, please reach out to me on Twitter at Detecting The or Instagram at The Metal Detecting Podcast. Or if you want to pop me an email to Kieran at the Metal Detecting Show.com. And now, if you would like to leave me a voicemail, please do so on speakpipe.com forward slash the metal detecting show. The link will be in the show notes. If you would like to buy me a coffee, you can actually do so now with buymeacoffee.com forward slash metal detecting. And lastly, and most importantly, if you like this content, please don't hesitate to tell your friends and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Hey Detectorist, welcome to episode 42. I hope this start to 2021 has been a good one for you. Unfortunately, we have gone back to level 5 lockdown again in Ireland, with our COVID-19 infections skyrocketing here in excess of 1,500 cases per 100,000 people, which is one of the highest globally right now, and unfortunately, it has even affected my own personal life, with my wife having to go for testing just this morning. So assuming it is positive, then in all likelihood it is in the house and will spread, but let's be positive. I did manage to get out with the Equinox last week and had a tough hunt with nothing of note found, not even a toasty, but I did have the kids with me out with the Nocta Mini Horde and the Simplex, so I was a bit distracted with them. However, the highlight of the hunt was when my own son found a metal detector. It was a kid's National Geographic model which we managed to return to its five-year-old owner who was delighted and joined us for a few minutes hunting with the big boys. But my son was delighted to have found a metal detector while metal detecting. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody we got our first voicemail on SpeakPipe this week from Jim the DIY Detector who gave me some great advice for my problems in mounting my button. Hello Karen, my name is Jim the DIY Detector in Florida, USA. I'm a new listener, but I do appreciate your podcast. I wanted to thank you for getting right to the point of metal detecting. Some other podcasts I've listened to have so much chit-chat and uh, small talk. Uh, I get lost and I get discouraged and I, I don't listen to a full broadcast. So thank you. Also, thank you for keeping it short and to the point. And the points that you've been making uh, have been really good and beneficial to me. I have been brainstorming about your dilemma about mounting your button that you found. I wanted to know if you had tried a magnet on the back of the card. You had mentioned there's a little bit of rust, so I imagine there might it might be a back made out of steel or iron that would stick to. You may need to uh, take a hole punch and punch a little hole so it sticks directly onto the magnet, but on the back side. Hope that makes some sense. Also, if it's a button, does it still have the shank where you could actually put a piece of thread through it and sew it onto a piece of cloth and then glue that cloth onto the card. Uh, there's a couple of other things I thought of, but I know this needs to be short. But keep up the good work. I'll keep listening. I have to say, Jim, I kicked myself for not thinking of this solution sooner. So I ran and grabbed a neodymium magnet I had on the fridge to try out your suggestion. And I'm afraid it didn't work. It seems that the button is not iron based, but copper based, which obviously won't stick to the magnet. The hunt continues, but thanks, Jim. I got a great surprise and a kick out of your feedback. So on to this week's topic, meteorites, or more importantly, meteorite hunting. But when does a meteorite become a meteorite? Well, according to NASA, when meteorites enter the Earth's atmosphere at high speed and burn up, the fireballs or shooting stars are called meteors. When a meteorite survives a trip through the atmosphere and hits the ground, it's called a meteorite. Why do we want to hunt for these space rocks? Well, like normal day-to-day -day metal detecting, if you can call it that, the reasons are twofold, with the first reason being monetary, as a good average meteorite specimen will fetch north of $50 per gram, 
But if your meteorite can be traced back to the moon or even Mars, these can fetch north of $1,000 per gram. So worth more than gold or diamonds. And if you've ever held a meteorite, you know that they are unusually dense or heavy. So a lot of dollars to be had there. The other reason to hunt meteorites is for the scientific knowledge that can be gained by their discovery. This usually involves affiliating yourself to a university who are more than happy to assist you in identifying a meteorite, especially if you are inclined to donate or lend it to the university for research purposes. In this case, meteorite hunting becomes more of a scientific expedition and quite a lot of meteorite hunters do it to collect them and relish in adding new specimens to their collection. Sounds familiar? It is estimated that probably 500 meteorites reach the surface of Earth each year, but less than 10 are recovered. So how do you go about finding meteorites? Well, this can be split into two avenues as well, new versus old meteorites. If you are searching for new meteorites, this is meteorites that have just fallen recently in the last few years, you need to gather eyewitness accounts of the meteorite entering the atmosphere as a fireball or shooting star and by using the eyewitness's location carry out trajectory calculations. This is an extremely complex process as the eyewitness accounts only account for the bright section of the flight, plus can be considered anecdotal as who remembers exactly which way they were looking at what time and to what degree was the fireball in the sky. So because of this it is essential that you have more than one account to draw upon and negate the ambiguity. What the trajectory calculations are calculating is the dark flight plat of the meteoroid or when the meteorite speed drops below 3 to 4 km per second. This will tell you the likely location or area to hunt as the meteorite will soon drop after it enters its dark flight phase. But that only gives you an approximate location to hunt and these strewn fields can be as big as a few kilometers across and long. Lucky for us, there are many tools online to help with these calculations, with the AMS or the American Meteorological Society being my favorite. I'll put the link in the show notes. If looking for older meteorites is your plan, then the best course of action is to use the existing data on the AMS website. For example, to go to sites of recent or old meteorite finds and identify possible other sites to search. What AMS also does is catalog eyewitness accounts for you to review and calculate possible strewn fields. Check it out, it's pretty cool. It also catalogs meteorite find sites, which are a great place to start. As you know, if there's one there, there's always a chance there will be two. So now you have identified potential sites to search for meteorites. But now you have the permission problem, which as you know, can take years to sort out. This is compounded as in general, it's finders keepers when it comes to meteorites. So the landowner has no skin in the game to let you search on their land unless you grant them a percentage of the value if found. But then you have to sell it to realize that value for the landowner. Once you have permission, you can start your hunt. And this is normally done with a metal detector, depending on how recent the meteorite fell. As newer meteorites will sit on the surface and can be detected with literally a magnet on a stick. If you are lucky enough to live in places like Utah or Nevada where there are large expanses of desert for you to walk, this magnet on the stick is the preferred method as a recently fallen dark or black meteorite will be clearly visible in contrast to the bright dust surface in these arid areas of the world. If looking for older meteorites, then a metal detector is a must as once under the surface there will be no other physical indication of a meteorite's presence. As meteorites are nearly 100% iron with some containing various amounts of nickel, you will need to run your detector fully open with discrimination turned off. Then it is simply a case of walking the site, digging everything, much like normal metal detecting really, and hopefully you will find that needle in the haystack. Before we go on to how to identify meteorites, I want to call something out that may or may not be obvious. If you live in a wet or humid area like Ireland, for example, you are unlikely to find any meteorites beyond a few years old for the simple reason that they will rust away to nothing due to these conditions. So bear that in mind when selecting a site. OK, how to be sure you have a meteorite and not some random piece of iron slag or a meteor wrong? There are a few tests you can do, the first being the magnetic test. Now, a meteorite should be attracted to a magnet, but not just likely, but really attracted like a teenager to a substitute teacher. It should take effort to prize the magnet 
and the meteorite apart. That's test one. The next test you can do is give it a good feel. It should feel unnaturally heavy for its size. This is due to the high iron content. Next, it shouldn't have any pinholes or vesicles in it. If it looks like a pumice stone, it is not a meteorite. Looking at a meteorite's surface closely should display some evidence of a fusion crust. This is a black layer, typically on one side, that side being the side that pierced the atmosphere, leaving a black skin or crust. And finally, if you are lucky, there may be what is described as thumbprints or regma lips, as you call them when you want to impress someone. All these tests will give you a good indication if you do indeed have a meteorite on your hands. However, it will take the analysis by a university or someone in the know for you to be sure. Again, only 10 of 500 meteorites are found every year, making them extremely rare but rewarding to find. However, there is a new discipline emerging that is still part of meteorite hunting but is accessible to all, and that is the hunt for micrometeorites. These meteorites are less than 0.2 of a millimeter in size. But it is estimated that 60 to 100 metric tons of these float down to earth every year as they don't burn up simply because of their size. But this means there is one micrometeorite per every meter square falling to earth every year. So right now there are people collecting the dust that gathers on the flat roofs of buildings, passing it through several cleaning cycles, followed by separating out the magnetic material using a neodymium magnet. This material is then saved to remove more of the unlikely material, leaving behind a pile of likely micrometeorite candidates, which are then painstakingly checked in a microscope to see if they resemble what a micrometeorite would look like. And that is a teeny tiny metal ball bearing, each of which can look completely different to the last one, but beautiful in its uniqueness. So whether you are hunting for the latest meteorite to fall, or looking to pick up a forgotten sliver of one that may have been left behind on an already discovered site, it is safe to say meteorite hunting is one of the most challenging and rewarding disciplines of metal detecting. That's it for this week. I hope you liked this episode of the Metal Detecting Show podcast. Check out our website www.metaldetectingshow.com for this episode's show notes. Check out our Patreon page if you want to help the podcast stay alive or just want to buy me a coffee. Actually, if you want to buy me a coffee, you can do so now at buymeacoffee.com forward slash metal detecting. If you'd like to leave me a voicemail, please do so on speakpipe.com forward slash the metal detecting show. The link will be in the show notes. And if you feel like taking your appreciation to the next level, feel free to leave me a positive review on any podcast directory of your choice. If you like this content and would like more, please don't hesitate to tell your friends and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this episode. We will chat to you all again next week. Get out there, eyes down and happy hunting. <laughs>